Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Michael Tewitt from the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, along with my co-conveners, Amy Williams and Emily Cardarelli. We welcome you here to this uh, great session uh, where we're going to address um, the astrobiological investigations enabled by NASA Mars 2020 mission and sample return. Uh, a note to um, our presenters, you're going to get a one-minute uh, warning from Emily. Uh, try to wrap it up as soon as you can. Uh, we do have time for discussion at the end of the session. Uh, in addition, at, uh, when the session ends at 2.30 uh, Eastern Time, uh, there is an, a, an online uh, only session uh, that we will host. Uh, so when this wraps up, if you can jump online, there are a number of other really interesting talks. So to get things started, uh, I'd like to introduce Luther Beagle, who will uh, talk about Sherlock. Everyone, thanks for having me. Um, this uh, talk is basically the uh, um, discussion of what we've seen over the first year of uh, on the Martian surface uh, using Sherlock and Watson as a, a search for potential biosignatures and to document samples. A lot of what I'm going to talk about here is actually in press, so we'll give you a little uh, uh, high-level things of what, what should be coming down the pike um, and how everything's going. Um, this is Sherlock uh, and Watson. It is an arm-mounted instrument that does laser Raman spectroscopy along with um, fluorescent spectroscopy and microscopic imaging. Watson is a, basically a reflight of the Molly camera. Uh, it does uh, up to uh, 13 uh, pixels per uh, uh, microns per pixel uh, and um, uh, does variable field focus. So the image you saw on the previous page of the selfie we took with that particular camera. Uh, Sherlock itself uh, has an, uh, what's called an ACI, it's an autofocus and contextual imager. It's a 10 micron per pixel grayscale imager. Um, and it, that's what uh, enables us to do this, the Raman and spectroscopy uh, on a particular point and map it up to a texture in, in a particular sample. Uh, Sherlock stands for uh, Scanning Habitable Environments with Raman and Luminescence for Organics and Chemicals. And yes, it is the most contrived acronym on the mission, uh, with the possible exception of the Watson camera, which is uh, weird appendage tapped to Sherlock for operations and navigations, but they wouldn't let us call it that. So we went with wide, wide angle topographic sensor for operations and navigation. Um, and it's a high resolution camera. And the way Sherlock works is uh, we, take, uh, we take images with Watson, uh, we, look at the, we look at the textures, we can take uh, an image of the boulder and then we zoom in uh, to a particular spot. And then we take an ACI image and the ACI image is shown here on the, on the, the, the middle. Um, this image is uh, 12 by 16 millimeters, 10.1 microns per pixel. It's a fixed focused imager. And then we can scan a laser across a surface. And what we do is we're looking for two different signatures one is Raman and one is fluorescent spectroscopy. So we can make these colored, colorized maps uh, like you see here uh, from this, uh, from this, fig, the, this is a, a piece of fig, a fig tree. Um, so you can see where the mineralogy is from the Raman and you can actually tell where the organics are from the fluorescence. Um, uh, Sherlock is, consists, consists of uh, the ACI imager, uh, we already talked about that, a deep UV laser 248.6, uh, the Watson camera on the right side, the four optics, the spectrometer, and the context imager uh, all, on, all on the side. Um, uh, basically, the, the spectra is taken uh, from each individual uh, point on the surface. Uh, we have an internal scanning mirror. We move that scanning mirror across the surface and we can rasp the laser across the surface. And we take the Raman and fluorescent spectra at the same time on the same CCD, uh, uh, which is basically uh, thermally controlled by a, um, by a, um, a phase change material, which limits the how long we can actually operate on a surface, which limits the number of points we can actually obtain. So what is Raman spectroscopy for those of you who uh, don't know? Uh, Raman spectroscopy is when you shoot uh, laser light at a sample, um, three things can happen. One is Raleigh scattering. Uh, that is when the light comes off and it's the same color as it, it, it hit. So if I, hit a, if I turn a, a red laser beam and on that wall back there, you'll see the red, that's Raleigh scattering. Uh, it is the most um, uh, intense of the radiation that, that, that can come across. Also, you can get uh, two different types of Raman, uh, Raman and an uh, Stokes and anti-Stokes uh, scattering. We only focus on the, the, the Stokes scattering. I mean, the, Ram, the, the excuse me, the Raman anti-Stokes uh, Stokes scattering. And then um, that is uh, uh, collected by our, our optics uh, in, in there. 
Um, and uh, what it does is it gives a fingerprint of a particular mineral or a chemical. Um, uh, in this particular case, this is from Haley Saper's papers from a few years ago. Uh, we were looking at different uh, types of uh, um, nucleic acids. Uh, and you can see the, the difference in, uh, in, in the Raman signature from the nucleic acids that we looked at. Um, the Raman uh, does reveal uh, molecular vibrations. Basically, we're looking for CH stretch, C, H, C, C stretches, things like that. Um, and then the fluorescence. The fluorescence basically is resonant for organics at this particular wavelength, um, especially organics uh, that are uh, uh, polyaromatic hydrocarbons. So uh, what we do is we see a ton of these uh, organics. It's a very strong uh, a signature um, in fluorescence, uh, and um, uh, we, can, we can detect very, very small parts per, uh, very small concentrations, over 100 micron beam size. Um, so the first thing we did when we landed on the surface was we looked at the Cal target. This is a, a paper that's been accepted for space science reviews. It talks a lot about this. Uh, and what, this, what the Cal target is, is kind of shows you exactly what we, how we do it and how we function. Um, uh, the Cal target is made up of 10 different samples. Uh, we have the maze target that tells us how big the laser spot size is. Um, uh, and you can see the dust that has accumulated on this over the course of two months. Um, uh, it is a, a solvable maze and actually uh, there's only one solution to it. Uh, we sent a piece of Mars back. This, is, this piece of Mars is on loan from the Natural History Museum. Um, I have to return it someday, um, but uh, we'll worry about that um, much, much later. Um, it is uh, um, uh, the SAU meteorite, it's SAU um, 008. It's a carbonaceous chondrite, and we have nice uh, uh, samples of that, and we've, we've calibrated the laser and the, the spectrometer on the, on the surface using that. Uh, and then this, uh, we have uh, spacesuit materials, four different types of spacesuit materials. This one is uh, a Teflon, and what you can see here is you can kind of see uh, how the, the, the concept works and, and, and how big everything is. The outer image there, the color image, is a Watson image uh, that we took for, on uh, Sol 59, and the individual ACI images are the grayscale ones that you can kind of see here, and you can kind of see how everything works and how uh, the, the, the ACI is kind of scattered with respect to things. Um, when we took the spectra, this is a pic, uh, spectra of Teflon uh, from the, the spacesuit material, uh, and it matched up perfectly with what we thought it was going to be. So as we landed on the surface, nothing in the spectrometer uh, got out of line, which was really cool because everything's kind of uh, um, done to about a micron precision scale uh, inside the spectrometer. This is the first abrasion target we did. It's a target called Guillaume. Uh, and um, uh, um, what we do on Perseverance is we basically take uh, uh, all of the instruments and kind of look at the same target together. And this is much more powerful than just looking at one thing individually. And so here you can kind of see where the individual instruments uh, took their individual scans and we kind of do overlap. Pixel is an elemental abundance uh, analyzer. It's a um, X-ray, um, X-ray, um, and they um, uh, uh, they do elementals, and it helps us uh, understand things because sometimes Rama peaks have the same kind of Rama peaks, so we can kind of differentiate things. And they they take our data and then they they analyze our, from our data what they're looking at because it is a discrete point. Uh, Pixel also is a hundred micron scale uh, uh, spectrometer. Um, so what we can do is we can look over the we can look over the, the rock. We scan the rock with uh, and we add SuperCam in there. We can identify the fact that this particular sample uh, at Guillaume uh, was made as a mafic com composition, uh, had had plenty of salts in it, sodium chloride uh, from Pixel, and then we saw the calcium sulfate. Uh, there was a lot of uh, iron oxides, and we saw silicates, uh, including plagioclase and peroxine uh, and uh, the uh, mineral appetite uh, in this particular sample. Um, we've done, uh, this is uh, uh, kind of what we do with uh, the Sherlock data. Data set, um, uh, we basically scan the laser and then we look at different hot points, hot points along the surface. So uh, what you see here is um, you see the scan of, of, of where, the, where Sherlock went in and in the bottom scans are where the, the 960, the 1020, and the 1110 Raman feature is, is strongest. Um, so now then we can go back in and we map that out with, um, with, with the textures to really understand what, what happened to the rock and where the rock has come from. Um, uh, we've identified uh, possible uh, phosphate, sulfate peaks, uh, and, and we can actually map those two things out where they fit in the, um, in the, um, um, the light tone versus the dark tone uh, regions uh, of, this, of the, the sample. 
Um, uh, this is one of the s survey scans we've done. Uh, basically, we do a 100 micron laser spot and we scan it across the surface. Uh, sometimes we, we change the number of points depending on what we're looking for. Um, and here we found uh, a bunch of calcium sulfate um, and uh, calcium phosphate uh, differentiable inside the rock itself. Um, and those, those samples actually do correlate to textures on the rock and you can kind of see how the rock formed and this gives us a, a little bit of more information of everything uh, is going on. The blue square here is uh, six uh, millimeters per side for, uh, for reference. Um, this is a, a, a slide that uh, Sananda Sharma showed uh, in her talk on Monday. Um, basically, this is the um, uh, uh, a sample called GARD, uh, where we see carbonates, we see olivines, and we see kind of uh, car carbonates and olivine in the same exact spot. We also um, found uh, this particular spot, uh, and this is part of Eva's paper that's uh, in review um, right now, where you can actually map out um, within the, um, uh, within the uh, texture of the particular rock, you can actually map where the organic material is, and you can kind of see that it correlates to this particular feature, uh, and we can go back in and, and determine what mineralogy that particular feature has, especially if we've got the pixel overlays as well. Um, so this was, uh, this was pretty exciting uh, uh, for us. Um, uh, the last uh, sample we did uh, before we uh, drove to the Delta front, um, this is uh, alfalfa, and this is the abrasion on, um, uh, that we did. And basically the textures and minerals of this particular abrasion patch did support the igneous uh, volcanic origin for the crater floor rocks, which is uh, currently in review as well. Um, uh, and hopefully that paper will be uh, published soon. Um, so, so far we've collected uh, eight cores. We've done, uh, what is it, um, uh, 10 different abrasion patches. Uh, each individual abrasion patch is, we've learned something new on. Um, getting below the, the the weathering layer outside that with all the, the dust and everything in there um, has been really fascinating to see the rocks, what the rocks actually look like not covered uh, with dust and, 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 and um, things that have been um, evolved over the course of, uh, you know, the three billion years this material has been on the surface. Um, thanks for listening. This is a partial list of everybody who has uh, been part of this, including the engineers who helped build it, the current science team members. Uh, um, and we, um, uh, we really, really do thank you for your, uh, your um, uh, attention. <laughs>
the rover needs to be in a state of charge in next next sol so that we can you know that does limit our ability to do things but with anything there's always when you have rare resources you've got to make a good trade space uh, and it's uh, um, that sometimes becomes a little um, a little stressful trying to choose whether we're going to scan for an hour or scan for two hours or uh, do something like that or use pixel before us or after us and, and those things all have to be worked out but the the science team has been really good especially in COVID. Um, it's there you go. I did, I did, I did talk fast, didn't I? Um, the science team has come together pretty, pretty well, given the fact that we've all been remote the whole time. And it's the uh, first time I've seen a lot of people that worked on the mission is at this, at this conference, and it's been, it's been nice to see people. Thank you so much, Lucan. So I'm happy to introduce our second speaker. Uh, Emily Cardarelli is going to speak about assessing organic preservation and the implications for potential biosignatures in the Bastide member of the Seta Formation, Jezero Crater. Thank you, Amy, and thank you, Luther, for a great introduction to Sherlock, as well as to some of the wonderful abrasion patches that we've looked at with Sherlock so far. So the primary Mars 2020 mission objectives center on characterizing the geology of Jezero and the surrounding area and understanding uh, the processes of formation as well as alteration within these rocks. The astrobiology relevant goals for this area include assessing habitability of the environment of these, these ancient areas, as well as seeking evidence for signs of past life. And in seeking uh, signs for past life, then selecting sampling locations that we can we can choose to move forward with uh, with sampling that have a high biosignature preservation potential. As Luther mentioned, it could be hard sometimes on a team of 400 people to decide where to sample. So identifying um, areas where we have high biosignature preservation potential is quite important and. As the session suggests, this is all a part of uh, our three-phase plan to bring the samples, not only collect the samples, but to eventually bring them back to Earth as part of Mars sample return. So in Jezero and around Jezero, uh, we see we were fortunate enough, as Katie mentioned on Tuesday, to land at the contact of uh, two major uh, mineralogies. So the olivine bearing unit, which is in bright red, as well as uh, the calcium bearing pyroxene unit. And since landing, we traversed around, uh, sure if you can see, traverse the traverse around the bottom of this uh, part here. And the red colored unit is the olivine bearing unit that we now refer to as SETA. And I'm going to be talking about that further. And we're, I was particularly interested in uh, speaking about this, this formation because as you might notice, the olivine bearing unit also co-occurs with a uh, strong carbonate signature, as well as a signature for uh, alteration minerals. And this is where, we're, where we've been and where I'll be talking about today. So that was the starting location of our landing site uh, is in, on the right side. And the blue marker is where we currently are. So this was uh, the first 250 sols. 270 sols or so. So the olivine bearing unit is of particular interest because uh, there, are thought, there are hypotheses that the reason why the carbonate bearing unit uh, so closely is associated with the olivine bearing unit is because the olivine bearing unit has undergone aqueous alteration producing the magnesium rich carbonate, which may be capable of preserving astrobiological signs of ancient life. And on Earth, uh, we see magnesium carbonate, also known as magnesite, um, intruding an ultramafic protolith in Australia. And within this sample, uh, so the blue is magnesium. Uh, we've been able to observe halite overlying the magnesite. And then on the halite, uh, you can see there are some purple, uh, oops, some, some purple magnesite as well. And then red is uh, carbon, and you can see they are round, rounded, and there are sort of three rounded shapes there, as well as a potential dendritic structure to the left. When we zoom in, uh, this might be a sign of life that perhaps 
might expect to see in a preserved in a carbonate. So within this talk, I'll talk about, I'll build on what Luther mentioned in terms of the power of multi-instrument detections and how by applying multiple instruments to a single target, we can gain insights into the, the provenance of the samples as well as the, its alteration history and potential preservation within this unit. Also talk about uh, micron scale mineral mapping within the SETA formation and localized organic detections that have been made so far and talk about uh, implications of finding carbonated olivine as a potential place to preserve uh, biosignatures. So as Luther mentioned, I'll be talking about uh, results from Sherlock, uh, which is capable of detecting mineral, which is capable of de simultaneously detecting minerals and organics in a microtextural context with deep UV Raman and uh, native fluorescence at 100 microns. Uh, scale or so. And Sherlock, as well as Pixel, are the two instruments on the arm that are capable of proximity science that I'll be talking about today. However, uh, insights from the mass base arm, or sorry, the mass, the mast, including mass cam Z and super cam, have also helped inform uh, some of what I'm talking about today. So from the orbital scale, we see the SETA formation in dark green, and we see it contacting the MOS formation, which Lisa will be talking about later, and its astrobiological uh, preservation potential. And the Bastide outcrop and Brock outcrop uh, are where the two abrasions were taken that I'll be talking about today. And when we first arrived at these outcrops, we still weren't certain if these rocks were igneous or sedimentary, given their layered structure in both the Brock and Bastide outcrops. However, once we were able to abrade these surfaces, uh, we saw that there is a crystalline texture indicating that these, these rocks were igneous in nature. And from the abrasion patch, we're able to take different size scans as well as scans that are capable of uh, analyzing different areas with different numbers of pulses per point. So the white square in the center is the five by five millimeter area that uh, analyzed with the survey scan that, that completes uh, 1,296 points and does 15 pulses per point and then looking for areas of uh, fluorescence. And then from there, we can select detailed scans. Uh, the blue area is a larger area where we completed uh, 100 analysis points and 500 pulses per point. And the benefit of using a greater number of pulses per point is that you could be more, you can potentially be more confident in your mineral identification from the Raman spectra that you get. And I'll talk more about the detailed scans one millimeter by one millimeter and uh, where we completed uh, 100 pulses per point. So we can also pair Sherlock with additional instruments as Luther mentioned, at, for example, with Pixel. So in the Dorb abrasion patch, we very well co-located the area that we analyzed with Sherlock as well as with Pixel, which provided uh, additional information into the provenance of the sample, able to see the elemental distributions of uh, magnesium and silica as well as calcium and silica, we're able to identify that this is a cumulant texture and that this purple olivine grain here was embayed by a pyroxene. However, we also see uh, sulfate and carbonate and uh, feldspar within the cracks here indicating that aqueous alteration has occurred within the sample. So moving back to the other abrasion patch that I mentioned, uh, GUARD, this was an abrasion patch in which we had a survey scan as well as um, two of the blue scans, which are our HDR scans that have 500 pulses per point. So we're able to uh, get improved mineral detection as well as these detailed scans. So we're really able to look at the mineralogy as well as the distribution of organics across scales. So within the HDR scan, we we're able to determine uh, the, lo the location where we saw carbonate as well as olivine signatures. And this was pretty exciting uh, because this was the first, this was the first evidence of uh, the localization that we're able to see from orbit 
in an abrasion patch. So here we see the distribution of olivine, which tends to occur on the darker colored euhedral greens and uh, carbonate either co-occurring with the olivine or around it. And so we see this really nice uh, co-location within this area. And moving to the detailed scans, when we look at the carbonate on, so this again is a seven by seven millimeter uh, area. When we move down to a one by one millimeter area, we're able to see that the carbonates here tend to occur on the uh, light toned areas within the, the image presented. And uh, looking at the, the Raman spectra, we see the presence of olivine, which is this first blue peak. And we see the presence of, uh, we see the peak uh, being well fit by magnesite, which is our magnesium carbonate. So we're seeing the magnesium carbonate signatures adjacent to these olivine grain boundaries. And in this bottom, uh, bottom sample, we're also seeing this hump here, which may be indicative of uh, amorphous silicate. It's present as well. And when we look at the uh, fluorescence features, and look at areas where we see strong intensity at the 400 nanometer uh, range, we see that in the middle scan and the bottom scan that this area seems to co-locate with this uh, depression feature that is adjacent to this light colored uh, tensile carbonate region. And then uh, a similar trend with the, the bottom one, but we do see that the fluorescence is very strongly localized with uh, its potential silicate and carbonate signatures at these green boundaries and uh, potential reaction fronts. And this, uh, this position, this, four, this 340 nanometer feature may be consistent with uh, double ring aromatic, aromatics. So some key takeaways from what we found so far is uh, this mineral suite enables uh, simultaneous mineralogical and compositional measurements across scales from the outcrop scale down to the millimeter uh, submicron scale or micron scale. And we observed these in situ associations of carbonates uh, potentially derived from ultramafic aqueous alteration uh, with the organics. And we see that these organics are very localized features uh, concentrated at the edge of green boundaries for the targets that have been analyzed within this formation. And we also observe that the carbonated olivine within the SETA formation uh, may be a potential biosignature pres preserving environment for Jezero. And with that, I'd like to highlight some ongoing work. So we'll continue to constrain the distribution and speciation of uh, carbon within this mission. And even if uh, the synthesis of the organics is uh, abiotic due to aqueous alteration, rock water interactions, uh, knowing where and what type it is is still important for understanding the carbon on Mars. And as Lisa will pick up with, she will will be doing uh, unit based comparisons as well to see what we find between between different units. And with that, I'd like to thank the Sherlock team. Uh, none of this would have been possible without them and take any questions or at the end. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks so much, Emily. So we do have a couple of minutes for questions. I would like to remind you, we have two, at least two microphones available if you want to bring that up and then Anyone online, feel free to uh, post your questions in the chat and we can bring them up to the room. So I can I can kick it off and give you the, yeah. the most wishy-washy uh, question because I don't know that any of us have the answer. Um, but as you pointed out, you know, we landed in the crater floor and we weren't sure if we were looking at sediments or igneous rock at the, that point. Do you have a sense for, or could you predict, do you think that if we get into a really organic rich location in the Delta, I mean, is, is uh, Sherlock just going to light up? I mean, is this just, is it going to be super obvious right from the start? Like, look at all these organics here. Or are we going to really have to pick through the data in order to find those organic signatures in the Delta? 
Well, I think that really depends on the type of scans that we start with. Uh, however, most times we start with a survey scan, which is uh, fewer pulses per point, so that's 15 pulses per point over a, and the, the spots are as closely uh, positioned as, as we can get them, and so we're able to cover a medium-sized area, but quite thoroughly, and just and one more minute. <laughs> then we can then we can move from uh, so if we see fluorescence with the 15 pulses per point, then Sherlock is actually capable of uh, then refocusing to the areas where it sees the fluorescence and then taking additional scans with higher numbers of pulses per point after that. Fabulous! I'm really looking forward to it. This will be great. All right, excellent. Thank you. Thank you. All right, wonderful. So our next speaker um, is Lisa Mayhew, who is going to be presenting, uh, sharing their screen from a virtual location. Oh, home. <laughs> and this goes location. Yeah. If only it was that mysterious. Okay. Can you see my slide? Yes, and you are not in presentation mode yet. Okay, and I'm gonna see you. So perfect. Great. Oh. Yep. Just switch to the other swap displays, and you'll be set. There you go. Does that look okay? Five by five. <laughs> awesome, Amy. Thanks. <laughs> okay. Um, thank you all so much for having me. I'm really sorry that I can't be there in person with you all. Um, but regardless, today I'm um, looking forward to sharing with you. Um, some work we've been doing investigating the astrobiological potential of um, what I'm going to call Rubion-like rocks that we have found on the Jezero Crater floor during the first um, year of the mission, our first year of exploration. Um, and I'm showing this image. This is um, the Rubion rock itself with the Guillaume abrasion patch. And um, what we notice here, and hopefully you all will notice too, is um, reddish coloration that was perhaps iron staining pits and holes and white patches, all characteristics that suggest that this rock underwent alteration. And in fact, when we attempted to sample this, this was our first sampling attempt, um, we were unable to get a sample in a tube and that was also suggestive of extensive alteration and made this feel even more astrobiologically compelling um, in order to, get a sample that would give us the secondary mineral record of multiple habitable aqueous environments that we think this rock could potentially represent. But it presents the challenge because um, these types of rocks um, you know, are, must, are less resistant and competent. Um, and so we were interested in, the, in um, sampling a water rock system that can support habitable environments um, for lots of reasons, but this sums it up um, nicely, this is a National Academies of Science recent publication in 2019, a consensus report that found that understanding chemosynthetic subsurface environments and saline fluids um, as potential habitats have implications for astrobiology. And as a result of that, they recommended that NASA missions should dedicate focus to exploring subsurface habitability. Um, and all of this stems from what we've learned in the last, especially five to 10 years, about um, life and organics in uh, water altered igneous rocks. So um, um, as I mentioned, there's been a lot of um, new research coming out in the last five to 10 years, indicating that these altered igneous rocks on earth can facilitate production of abiotically and biotically derived organic material. Um, a variety of multi-carbon and complex carbon molecules have been detected in these rocks. And the presence of functionalized molecules means that these rocks can produce molecules that are biologically, biotically interesting um, in that they, that they can sustain microbes as food and abiotically interesting um, with relevance to prebiotic synthesis processes and the origin of life. And, they, um, and these different organic materials have been detected amongst a variety of mineral assemblages. And this figure from Sforna et al. 2018 is illustrating that where we see clays and iron oxides um, and phyllosilicates um, along with some primary igneous phases like olivine 
um, in close association with um, condensed carbonaceous matter. And I'll particularly just call out olivine and serpentine as some of those um, mineral assemblages that are interesting here. Um, and diverse, not only do we know that we can find organic material in these water altered igneous rocks, we actually know that these um, lithologies on earth can host rich microbial ecosystems. And these um, ecosystems on earth are widespread. They occur in diverse lithologies and they vary with lithology and setting. And the microbes that we find in these um, rock hosted systems are powered by the energy held in these rocks. And so this figure here from Suzuki et al 2020 shows that we can image um, the presence of life in rocks and its association with different mineral phases. Um, the cells in green here on the right-hand side of each one of these paired images are being lit up by a DNA staining dye um, and are showing the co-localization of the cells at the interface between basalt and um, intruding vein material. And um, again, we can actually visualize cells in the subsurface of water altered igneous rocks. This is another example here from the Templeton et al. 2021 paper of cells um, at about 120 meters depth from the Oman Ophiolite. And beyond um, actually imaging um, cells, cells, we can detect a diversity of other biosignatures, including um, component, cellular components like membrane lipids. Um, Lee et al. 2020 found the presence of both archaeal and bacterial lipids in um, deep and old, up to 100 million year old basalts um, in the ocean crust. Um, we can also see, see things like bio biologically derived organic material and structures that can be identified um, using techniques such as Raman. And we um, <clears throat> see these altered igneous rocks as ubiquitous habitats on Earth. So where we see Igneous rocks in contact with water in terrestrial locations such as the Oman, Oman Ophiolite and also submarine systems like the basaltic or predatitic ocean crust. These are fully realized um, microbial habitats that vary across space and time. And it turns out that understanding these is pertinent as we um, explore the surface of Mars. Um, as was mentioned earlier um, by Luther and uh, Emily, it's been hypothesized by the Mars 2020 team that the rocks of the Jezero crater floor are igneous. And this is an image of a typical low-lying polygonally fractured um, paver morphology of the Mars formation um, with this rock I've been talking about um, located here, but the red arrow. And we see this morphology can is, look similar to morphologies we see in igneous water altered systems on earth. Um, this is an image of the Oman Ophiolite in the upper right here, where you can see that same polygonal um, shape. And the, this is caused by fluid flow and um, alteration. And you see these sharp and repeating alteration gradients um, caused by fluid flow through fractures. Um, and that represents you know, chemical gradients and disequilibrium. And it turns out when we, as I mentioned earlier, when we drill into or braid these rocks um, at Rubion and the Moss Formation, we found them to be um, altered and mechanically weak. We didn't get a sample. And we started to wonder, many of us, if we had the opportunity to abraid or drill in different areas of a, a paver, would we find more or less altered or resistant rocks, um, depending on where exactly we drill across a relatively short um, length scale, essentially wondering like, would we see this, these sharp alteration gradients buried under the dust um, that we can't see underneath in these images? So when I talk about alteration, you're probably wondering what kind of alteration we're observing in these Moz formation um, rocks. And in fact, the Guillaume, I'm sorry, Guillaume abrasion patch was the most hydrated abrasion patch that um, has been investigated on the crater floor. And according to data from SuperCam Visayar, um, that also has diverse alteration phases, um, phases that were, or signatures that Im implicated iron-rich phyllosilicates to be present, and also salts such as sulfates and perchlorates, which are highly soluble, and um, suggest that these salts were um, a last or very late stage um, episode in place from a last or late stage episode of aqueous activity. 
Um, and so we hypothesize that there are two different episodes of water rock reaction represented in these ruby on like rocks. And a first stage of reaction that was essentially limited to olivine alteration um, is a hypothesis that has grown out of um, pixel scan data where the alteration phases, those iron rich phyllosilicates um, have been identified as um, iron rich serpentines. If you look at this ternary diagram of magnesium, silica and iron, you can see that the data in blue um, plot mostly in these hysingerite and greenolite um, fields, and those are iron rich serpentine phases. And if you look at the pixel mineral map data, you can see that they're exclusively associated with an iron rich or phaolitic olivine. So in dark green is the olivine and light green is that altered olivine or olivine plus phyllosilicates. And you can see that close association there. Interestingly, and a little bit confusingly, um, you know, we also with this data, it was determined that plagioclase, pyroxene, and iron titanium oxides are present and those are occur in rel relatively pristine chemical compositions. So this suggests that the water rock interaction that these rubion-like or moss formation rocks have um, undergone occurred under low water rock ratios and rock buffered conditions. This left olivine heavily altered and other minerals relatively intact in terms of their chemical composition. And this has um, important implications for astrobiology because as we know from altering olivine on earth, you can produce hydrogen gas and, um, and support life that way. Um, so really quickly, I'm gonna also just point out that um, organics, and I'm gonna show some of the same data that Luther and Emily showed um, from Sherlock, um, organics um, perhaps consistent with one ring and two ring aromatics were detected in association with these aqueously altered materials. And Scheller et al. Um, hypothesized that they have a possible abiotic aqueous, uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> aqueous abiotic origin. Um, and and um, it Lisa, Lisa, you have 30 seconds. Oh, okay. So to sum it up, ruby on light, light rocks are a key astrobiological target. And they give us the opportunity to understand um, past habitability of an altered igneous system on Mars that has not yet been explored and how that might supply um, energetic substrates to support subsurface life. Um, and we can look in further detail into aqueous alteration conditions and processes responsible for production of organics. And just to wrap up really quickly, um, we did not get a sample but, of Rubion, but we did get samples of similar rocks from the crater floor. Um, though less likely less altered. And we can use these still to test hypotheses in labs on earth. And we're also looking forward to further exploring. Um, it looks like there's some olivine and serpentine signatures and sedimentary rocks in Jezero, and those will hold chemical energy that can be released during water rock reaction, perhaps being even more habitable with more pore spaces. And then we're excited to go on to the extended mission to further um, investigate the olivine and carbonate units that um, Emily was mentioning as well. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Lisa. And next we'll have Danny Glavin presenting on the search for chiral asymmetry as a potential biosignature in samples from Mars. Okay, great. It's a pleasure to be here to talk about uh, chirality, which is a topic that I've been interested in for quite a while now, and how we might use that as, as a, uh, a potential biosignature in samples from Mars. And if you're interested in this topic, I encourage you to uh, visit our chemical reviews paper that came out in 2020 uh, that really goes into detail about the criteria that we propose to establish the origin, and also shows how this is not just applicable for Mars, but other targets of astrobiological interest in our solar system. So the motivation is that homochirality, that's the, the bias towards left-handed amino acids and proteins and enzymes and right-handed sugars in DNA and RNA, is thought to be a unique signature of life. And some have argued that's a, actually a prerequisite for the origin of life. However, one of the caveats with this is that uh, through analysis of meteorite samples, um, which is abiotic chemistry, uh, we found large left-handed amino acid excesses of some protein amino acids up to 60% and even higher and right-handed sugar acid excess is up to uh, an antiopure, 100% D, 
which we know are produced by non-biological processes. So this definitely complicates the use of chirality as a definitive biosignature. So as a result of that, we provo proposed a set of measurement criteria, which is illustrated by this Venn diagram, um, where basically you've got to have the chiral asymmetry. We're looking for evidence of isotopic fractionation in those enantiomers, as well as a simple distribution. We know biochemistry, at least biochemistry here on Earth, is, is very distinct from abiotic chemistry. Uh, there's a simple distribution of, you know, 20 amino acids, standard amino acids, and, 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 and life on Earth with, with a heavy bias towards the left-handed form. In contrast, meteorites have a highly complex distribution of amino acids. We've found hundreds of different amino acids in the Murchison meteorite, and most of them are racemic, uh, equal mixtures of left and right, another indication of abiotic chemistry. There's also an isomeric preference in life on Earth. Uh, alpha hydrogen amino acids found in protein um, uh, dominate uh, life on Earth. And in contrast, meteorites don't appear to have any, most meteorites don't appear to have any isomeric preference. We see the complete structural diversity of all possible isomers. For example, we see alpha, beta, gamma, and delta uh, amino acids. And then finally, um, life has a unique sig signature of fractionation. We see that in the isotopes of carbon, nitrogen, and deuterium which are uh, heavily favored towards the, the, the lighter isotope. And in contrast with meteorites in general, especially ones that um, the organics formed in a cold environment, we see an enrichment in the heavier uh, isotopes. So how do we analyze uh, samples? Well, we use a solvent extraction uh, procedure. It's really been around for decades, um, since the late 60s. Been using this to analyze lunar samples and, and the Murchison meteorite when it first fell. 1969, and this hasn't really changed much, but there are a variety of steps, water extraction, acid hydrolysis, desalting, derivatization, that's required before you analyze a sample by liquid chromatography, high resolution mass spec, and, and gas chromatography techniques to get both the enantiomeric ratio as well as the isotope values. And I wanna point out that this is one of the real key benefits of sample return. Everybody seems to focus on you know, the fact that the instruments are more sensitive and selective, which is true, but it's really the flexibility you have in changing your extraction protocol, um, which is really important because you can adapt your extraction to the sample chemistry, um, which is really important. Okay, so back to the criteria here, and I'm gonna take you just through a couple examples, quick examples. Um, here's the positive control. Uh, we got some soil from Costa Rica. This was actually collected because the Aguazarcus um, carbonaceous chondrite landed there back in 2019, so we're using the soil as a control. And through liquid chromatography mass spec analyses, you know, we see, you know, the, the common protein amino acids of life. You see the left-handed uh, bias. So we have chiral asymmetry, a left greater than a uh, right for all amino acids, not just a select few. So that checks that box. We also see a simple distribution. We see in most cases, these are all alpha hydrogen amino acids, a few couple beta, there's one gamma delta, a gamma amino acid, but you know, much lower uh, abundance. So we see that uh, preference, a, a simple distribution. And then of course, the light, light carbon isotopic composition of the amino acids, which range from minus 18 to minus five per mil. So, here, you know, not surprisingly, you know, that, that's a pretty good bio, biotic signature. This is a really an interesting example, Martian meteorite uh, RBT-04262. This is a, a shergatite, it's an igneous rock, 225 million years, was ejected from Mars about three million years ago, recovered in Antarctica in 2004 by ANSMET. And to date, this is the cleanest Martian meteorite we've ever seen with respect to organic and biological contamination. Uh, there's just no evidence uh, that the amino acids uh, uh, you know, came from the terrestrial environment. This is even cleaner than the, the Tissant meteorite, which I know earlier in the meeting, folks were talking about how pristine that meteorite is. Not from an amino acid perspective, the Tissant really has evidence of uh, uh, amino acid contaminants from the, the desert soil. But RBT is special. Um, you know, we see the, this evidence of straight chain and omega amino acids here, beta alanine, gamma amino n-butyric, delta amino valeric. And the pattern is really similar to what we've seen in thermally altered meteorites, carbonaceous chondrites, kind of hinting at, at its origin there. But, you know, we check that first box if you're gonna use the criteria. We, we do see a simple distribution. We also see a light carbon isotopic composition. We first measured this, we, saw, we thought, oh God, this is for, for sure contamination. But I'll point out that this carbon isotope ratio is, is highly consistent with the magmatic carbon, the igneous carbon that uh, Steele and coworkers have reported in a variety of different Mars meteorites. It falls right within that range. So completely plausible that this is Martian. Um, but where we don't check the box is all of these amino acids are achiral. 
Um, so if you think chirality is important for life, you know, you, you can't check this box. Um, so we think that this is maybe a Fischer trope type Haber Bosch synthesis, something happening at high temperature, uh, potentially even during the impact when this thing was ejected. We're not sure. But so far, this is the best evidence we have for uh, amino acids on Mars. Now, the problem that we have, um, especially with the return samples, is going to be the radiolysis. Forget it all. We heard a lot about that in the meeting. Alex Pavlov gave a talk on a Monday. There was another one today um, as well. And this ionizing radiation can penetrate, penetrate down to you know a couple meters or so and break down large molecules um, and eventually destroy them with time. We know, for example, in Gale Crater that the cosmic ray exposure age of the Cumberland mudstone um, was roughly 80 million years. So, um, you know, it's not unlikely that we'll encounter, even in Jezero, samples that, you know, have experienced tens of millions of years of cosmic ray exposure. And this is uh, taken from Alex's uh, talk here. It's also coming out in astrobiology soon, but this shows basically the degradation of amino acids after the equivalent of 80 million years of ionizing radiation exposure. We use gamma. And you can see that, you know, at the sampling depth, you know, there's definitely some destruction there, especially if you have amino acids uh, mixed with uh, hydrated silicates and perchlorates. Um, you see a lot of degradation, you know, uh, even in, you know, 10, 20 million years. Um, so you really have to go deep, you know, um, to get access to, to more pristine material. Now, the caveat here is that when we look at pure amino acids or, or bound amino acids or amino acids that are associated with maybe a more reduced organic phase, you get better preservation. So there's, there's still hope here. Uh, if we can find some carrageenan-like material and there are amino acids in there, maybe, maybe there's some preservation. Um, one piece of good news here is we didn't see any evidence for racemization. That's the conversion of left and right-handed amino acids. So that's great. That means even if there was degradation due to cosmic ray exposure, the, the, iso the enantiomeric, enantiomeric ratio should be preserved. And then finally, just looking ahead to sample return time, you know, this is really exciting. Um, you know, up to 30 of the, the samples uh, that are being collected by Mars 2020 uh, will be, could be returned to Earth in 2033 and just a really important opportunity. Um, to look for chemical biosignatures, not just amino acids, but other chemicals. We know there are organics in these samples, right? We just need to really uh, look closely at their distribution, their isotopic compositions. Um, I would say that, you know, I'm not on the Mars 2020 team, but I'm sure there are discussions about finding samples that have experienced um, recent erosion, um, maybe higher wind erosion rates so that we can try to get samples back that haven't, you know, experienced 80 plus million years of cosmic ray exposure. Um, that could be important. Uh, looking forward to the coordinated analyses that will be a possible, um, the wet chemistry techniques that, you know, we just can't do on Mars right now, uh, and the search for amino acids and chirality. And I'll point out that, you know, even if the amino acids are destroyed, we find nothing. That's still going to be really important for the, the sample safety assessment, the biohazard assessment. If we do find amino acids and they're chiral, well, things get pretty interesting. Okay. Um, and then, you know, we can start looking at uh, possibility of life and that kind of thing. And I just want to acknowledge uh, my co-authors and uh, team members in the Astrobiology Analytical Lab at Goddard couldn't do any of this without their support and uh, the funding sources. So thank you. And next up, we have uh, Mark Sefton presenting on the effects of temperature and time on samples returned from Mars. You're still muted. Mark, if you're speaking, we cannot hear you. But we see your slides. Sorry. Um, <clears throat> so thank you. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, the effects of temperature and time on the samples coming back from uh, Mars sample return. And up front, huge thanks to the heroic efforts of the, of the full team uh, that I was very lucky to, to work with. Uh, me and Kate Freeman were, were chairs, but there was substantial inputs by um, uh, some key members of the team and all of the team. Um, so we're talking about Mars sample return in this session, and these are going to be precious samples, half a kilogram that's going to be coming back. 
we really want the best records of Martian conditions. So the fidelity of the samples are very important. Sorry about this. The fidelity of these samples are very important. Uh, we want the samples in as good a condition as possible. And so changes in temperature uh, can be quite an issue. And the allowable flight temperature limits currently are minus 20 degrees C maximum, but plus 30 is allowed for unavoidable operational transients. And these transients have to be modeled and these models have a certain level of accuracy. Anything over 30 degrees will be managed by a case by case uh, assessment of review and approval by the Mars Sample Return Program. So we feel that requests to exceed 30 degrees Celsius are likely, uh, and these can be during surface transport on Mars due to diurnal heating or during heat sealing of the primary containment uh, vessel. And in the worst case scenarios, we're looking at the sample tubes reaching 60 degrees Celsius in both situations. So the goal of the team was to consider the scientific risks and use this risk informed decision making process to come up with some sort of assessment of what the impacts would be. So the tasks were to consider the risk to science if the samples went from uh, 30 degrees to 40 degrees, 40 to 50 and 50 to 60, and also how long samples can be exposed to these temperatures without negative effects. And because there are lots of ways that we can look at this, we obtain practical focus by considering impacts on biosignatures and hydrated minerals. So we identified a number of key processes. These key processes were the, uh, the things that were gonna uh, cause the changes in the sample samples, and these were volatilization, the deliquescence of salts, acid-base interactions, aqueous redox reactions, isotope exchange, all of those uh, related to heating effects, but also with cooling subsequently, condensation and freezing and interactions with the container would also be important. And of course, there's potential for multiple interactions and overlapping effects. So we wanted to develop a caution classification system that was developed initially for the integrity of organic matter. And the integrity would be reliant on a number of processes. And we recognized that a change in one component would have an impact on another. And here on the right, you can see that heat would mobilize water, radicals, and oxidants. And these together can lead to organic degradation. And here's our caution classification system. We had colors that are green, yellow, and red. Green would have little impacts on science. Yellow, we'd have unwantable but acceptable losses of science, whereas red, would be substantial uh, losses of science. And you consider the effects of temperature and time are not linear. This is kinetics. You double, uh, you increase the temperature by 10 degrees C, you double the reaction rate. So we really want to constrain our temperature excursions. Here's an example of uh, one of the anorganic process that we examined. This is aqueous processes involved with the dissolution of solids that can release, uh, release encapsulated organics, making them accessible to degradation. Reduction of nitrate to ammonia in the presence of uh, ferrous ion can alter ratios. Oxidation of sulfides, producing sulfuric acid that can lead to acid hydrolysis. And the effects get worse at higher temperatures. So for inorganic science and the loss of science related to inorganic materials, we felt that every temperature uh, would lead to, every change in temperature between 30 and 60 would lead to a, a substantial loss of science. And so here's a, a summary of the, the whole uh, number of processes that we examined. And you can see that over long time scales, that is hours to days, no temperature excursion uh, could uh, give a minimal impact on science. They all gave a substantial impact. And over short time scales as well, still a substantial impact uh, and loss of science. Here we have an example of organic structures. Uh, and between 30 and 40 degrees Celsius, desorption, evaporation of volatile compounds, radical reactions are initiated. We know that from Weichling and acid hydrolysis occurs at low temperatures as well. Higher temperatures, larger organic molecules can be dissolved or evaporated. There's more risk of radical induced oxidation, but importantly, the 3D structure of any proteins or uh, biomaterials would be lost. So that's a bit of a bit of a red line. And again, high temperatures, faster rates of reaction. And so we would say 30 to 40 degrees Celsius, we could live with 30, uh, above 30 to 40 degrees, then we have a substantial loss of science. And over hours to days, everything uh, within that temperature range of 30 to 60 would cause a significant, well, substantial loss of science. 
Again, a summary table for the impacts on organic matter over long time scales. Everything would cause a substantial loss of science. And over short time scales, um, up to 40, we, we, we feel would be livable. And uh, above 40, then uh, you're leading to substantial losses. We can combine our, for a holistic view, our organic and inorganic uh, deliberations and considerations. And you can see that the really only temperature range um, and time range that wouldn't lead to a substantial loss of science, according to the team, would be 30 to 40 degrees Celsius over um, minutes to hours. Uh, higher temperatures and for longer periods, then a substantial loss of science would occur. And so would be avoided, should be avoided if possible. An explanatory note, and that is that interactions are possible between uh, inorganic and organic material. Um, organic matter is reducing, and if you heat organic matter in the presence of minerals, it changes the, the nature of the minerals, but we don't see this too much uh, below six degrees Celsius, so we think that's okay. And inorganic materials, well, you degrade those and you start to produce water radicals and oxidants, and they can affect organic matter. But it all depends on the concentrations. If you have lots of inorganics and a few organics, then the inorganics can really affect the organic matter and vice versa. So what's the bottom line? Well, other than for organics in the 30 to 40 degrees Celsius temperature range and the minutes to hours duration, everything else results in a substantial loss of science. And that's it. Sorry if I was trying to keep up with the timing that seems to be uh, happening on my slides, but um, finally, thank you to the audience for listening to the temperature and time team uh, for you. their efforts and to Mark. the reviewers that help us out. Thank you. Thanks. And with that, we'll move to our last talk. <clears throat> to close our session today, we'll have uh, Christopher House discussing using Mars Science Laboratory in situ isotope measurements to plan Mars sample return science. Methane evolved from Gale Crater rock samples show a wide range of carbon isotopic compositions. Okay, thank you, everybody. Um, hopefully, you can hear me and uh, my slides are showing. I did want to say just quickly that I had planned to be there and I wish I was there with you guys. Um, it, it turns out on Sunday morning, my youngest daughter got COVID and uh, that was a shock to us all and, and I didn't get on my airplane. So uh, don't worry, she's doing fine, but it's been, it's been a multitasking week. Um, I would like to talk to you about an unusual uh, carbon that uh, MSL team discovered and, re and ultimately reported on in a paper in January. Um, and, and because it might give guidance to the pure perseverance team on, on a, a unique sample that may be present there as well. So this is ultimately, we're talking about the pyrolysis results from the SAM uh, experiment on Mars. So in that, uh, that, that kind of experimental um, um, approach, we take solid Mars samples put them in the SAM oven, then the, the SAM oven heats them up uh, and a certain temperature cut is diverted to the tunable laser spectrometer. And we can then measure uh, the uh, methane that is released from pyrolysis. And, um, and also if there's enough methane, the isotopes, abundance of, of the C13 uh, isotopes. So we're talking about uh, in case, this case, nine years of exploration, so 24 samples. Uh, the methane was released, uh, showed a huge wide range of carbon isotope compositions. The whole range is, is plus 22 down to minus 137, with some uncertainty there. Uh, two samples then have enriched C13 methane released, uh, plus 11 and plus 22. And nine samples showed strongly depleted values of something like uh, beyond negative uh, 70 per mil. And that's at six different Gale lo uh, crater locations. And ultimately, I'll, 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 I'll get to this later, but there may be some association of the ones that sh show the strong depletion in, in C13 in the released methane uh, might be associated with a paleo surface. And that's why uh, I wanted to mention it to the Perseverance team and, and people can look out for such a surface. Uh, real quick uh, explanation of carbon isotopes for those that don't deal with it very often. Uh, do a historical, um, Contingency, we, we measure carbon, we report carbon isotopes relative to the PD belenite, uh, which is a fossil from South Carolina, 
It's a carbonate fossil. So typically, if you were just like a snapshot of the Earth's ocean today, carbonates tend to be around zero per mil on our scale. Organic matter tends to be around minus 28 on our scale. Uh, and, and in this case, the, the mantle carbon on Earth is around minus seven. And then coming out of the seafloor or out of caddies has a wide range, uh, thermogenic methane, all the way up to very strongly biogenic methane, can be ranged from minus 40 to, to minus 110, typically. And here's the data we got from, uh, from uh, the samples on Mars from Gale Crater. So there's the whole uh, data, data table from the, from the paper. Uh, and I've color coded it here to highlight the ones in blue are samples that gave strongly depleted delta C13 values for the methane coming out of the sample when it was heated. Uh, and so that's the Cumberland samples. And then there's also a, a scoop of sand from the, from the bangled, uh, Bagnell dunes. Uh, there's a couple of samples at the Bear Roof and Ridge top. Um, and then there is um, also just below and just above the pediment, this, uh, the pediment being made of Stimson formation sandstone. So, um, so across the whole mission, multiple times we've seen it and, and we've seen it repeatedly in certain locations like Bear Roof and Ridge. And it's possible, one way to link these different samples is if there was a paleo surface that um, that ran ran out from the Cumberland sample would be it then in that in that interpretation, the end of the Peace Vallis fan, the very end of the Peace Vallis fan, um, the the sand scoop would have to be derived from Stimson formation cap, cap rock, which uh, has a, a, a surface eroded uh, after. So it's a, it's a, it's a, a deposit on top of an unconformity, but it's also eroded off itself. Uh, and that surface then would have to be the part of the paleo surface, either below or below, above the cap. Um, and then another interesting feature that we that should be noted is that often this strongly depleted C13 values are seen in the same samples as we see reduced sulfur released during the evolved gas analysis, and also times when we see strong uh, negative uh, delta uh, um, S34 values in the SO2 release. So this graph on the right shows the core, the, I wouldn't call it a correlation, shows the co-occurrence of strongly negative C13 methane involved and, uh, as well as uh, negative delta 34S SO2 involved. So that's at least a constraint that needs to be considered as well. So we, we thought about a lot of different um, scenarios. And so I just wanna just throw out a couple of different um, scenarios. One, the first of which we, we don't favor, but should be mentioned is that if you saw this on Earth, you would you would say that this was methanotrophy from an, from atmospheric methane or from uh, seafloor methane. Uh, we see that uh, in the Tubiana formation of West Australia with whole rock values of down to minus 60 in the Eel River Basin uh, or, and other cold seeps around the margins around the world, you see strongly depleted uh, archaeal signatures, archaeal lipids, and you start see strongly depleted cells on the right. So, so that's, that's how you might interpret this data from, from Earth. Uh, we don't favor this, this hypothesis uh, too much because our, without more sedimentary data, we don't see any evidence for surface uh, methanotrophy like, like mats or, or other sedimentary features you might see in those sandstones. So the, uh, another scenario which, which uh, is plausible and uh, kind of out there uh, was put uh, was suggested by Alex Pavlov, and it's really creative uh, and can't be ruled out, and might actually be the be the case, is that the solar system every couple hundred million years goes through a giant molecular cloud, and if you look in the giant molecular clouds, you have a, a gas partitioning between dust and and uh, and, and uh, sorry carbon isotopes could partition between gas and dust by the by the UV, UV photochemistry. About one percent that dust of uh, that cloud is dust. So as the solar system goes through it, that dust then gets rained out on all the terrestrial planets, including Mars. We hardly notice on Earth because we have so much organic matter uh, whenever this would happen. Uh, and we, we have erosion and all kinds of other processes to mix that carbon in. But on Mars, you might accumulate that kind of dust on top. This was 10 to 17 grams. Um, you might accumulate that 10 to 17 grams of carbon on a glaciated surface because the dust would trigger, trigger a glaciation. So that might explain the paleo surface and might explain the accumulation of the weird isotope signature on top of it. Another scenario, which we can't rule out and put forward in the paper, 
is that you could have plumes of methane, which a MSL has detected over time, or every every now and then, and that those plumes of methane in, in, in ancient times might have uh, coincided with eruptions of, of volcanic gases, and you could get then CO two and SO two reacting with methane uh, with photochemistry and deposit the uh, methane as as acetylenes and other other uh, compounds onto the surface, and that would work. Except the only caveat here is that the the uh, methane would have to be biological because you you. The, the photochemistry of methane polymerization isn't strong enough uh, of fractionation to explain the really strong isotopes. So if, if you want to use methane to get there, you have to have it be biomethane. And then finally, the photolysis of CO2 might produce um, organics, uh, and certainly can produce organics in the lab. And that that uh, fractionation appears to be large. There's a, a theoretical paper in PNAS, and then there's also some, some data in, in, in PrEP from Yurichio Yunio's lab in Japan. Um, so as, as that unfolds, it certainly looks like a plausible mechanism that you might get photochemistry of CO2 in the Martian atmosphere depositing this material on the surface, even today. Uh, that would be the implications in this case that would be ongoing. Um, and again, it would be deposited on surfaces. So we don't know the origin of this weird carbon, um, but we've put forward a couple of hypotheses here. There is, um, in, shown in this figure, one would be biological subsurface methane production that then resulted in organics deposit on the surface. Another would be volcanic outgassing, uh, including uh, that then leads, leads to UV re reactions in the atmosphere that deposit organics on the surface. And finally, there'd be giant molecular cloud dust every couple hundred million years deposited on the surface. So I put forward that the Perseverance River might want to think about looking for these kinds of um, uh, surfaces, maybe a road off terrace that might imply uh, occurred during glacial period uh, as a possible, you know, if this, if this was happening Mars wide, we might be able to collect one of these samples and bring it back and understand this process. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chris, and, and thanks to all of our speakers. So we have time now um, for a discussion, and um, Michael is not bailing because he's <laughs> so done with the conversation, but he's going to run our online, our online sessions um, that will begin at 2.30 Eastern. So we are holding this time separate in the hopes that we can have a discussion based on these presentations. Um, so I know we have a few folks online. Again, folks can, can jump in online either on chat or especially our speakers can jump back in to uh, address questions. But can we motivate folks to, to start a discussion on, on the material they've heard today or to ask additional questions um, of our speakers? This is uh, Andy Chaya from University of Cincinnati. Uh, uh, I guess this question's for Chris. Uh, nice talk, Chris. Um, I enjoyed the paper too. I just um, I, I noticed at the very end you had a call out for a, a poster on on carbon concentrations, and that was my question. So I was wondering like, wh how much carbon was in these samples that you d did the isotope analyses on. I, yeah, I, I imagine it varied, but. It, it, it's a really good question, and and um, let me let me go back to that. Yeah, so there there is a paper, uh, an abstract from uh, Jen Stern about organic carbon concentrations in in the mudstones. There's also a paper in uh, that was published uh, um, some years ago in JGR by Brad Sutter on the topic. Those estimates are based on the paralysis of carbon. Uh, well, Brad Sutter's papers on the paralysis of carbon to CO two. And Jan Stern's paper uh, that's now in press, actually PNAS, uh, is on the um, uh, per, uh, the combustion experiment done uh, early on in the mission to that that then, then you have oxygen present during your heating, and so you move all of the carbon over to CO two. So those are better estimates of how much carbon is in the rock. Uh, the, the the tricky thing about the me methane um, data that I showed is it's a very, very small signal in terms of the amount of methane being produced. 
And it, so it doesn't represent the large bulk of the carbon in the rock. It represents an unusual phase of carbon that is releasing methane during paralysis. And we see it in some analyses and we don't see it when there's a huge, uh, you know, another big signal. It may be there other times, but we only see it in a subset of samples or washed out by, by other carbon releasing methane. Um, and so in particular, we have, we have MTBS DFA background in the, in the instrument and other organic instrument, uh, instrument. That methane has a nice type of composition around minus 35. And a lot of our samples then also show methane produced at minus 35. So, so that's why the paper focused on the extremes. But this paper is not the right paper to get an estimate of how much carbon's in the rock because it's, it's an unusual phase that's just producing, cleaving off methyl groups or whatever. Um, it's not the bulk of the carbon in the rock. All right, thanks. Actually, can I just ask one more? Uh, just quickly, uh, just a sort of a method question. Um, were these samples, uh, I mean, these were collected over nine years, you said. Uh, were these analyzed over nine years and then the data was now just kind of reduced and, and, and looked at? Or do you, are, are there, is the material preserved inside of the rover that can then be analyzed later? Right, so good question. So the, this, this is um, the paper that came in January was report, reporting analyses that had been done over nine years. Um, the data would go, the, the raw data would go to PA, uh, the PDS and uh, actually uh, the range of data what's mentioned in a, sub, a supplementary um, uh, online supplement to, to uh, Chris Webster's 2015 paper, um, but wasn't on this topic. <laughs> So, so, you know, it's been out there a little bit. And this finally was the paper uh, in January of the team uh, interpreting what we think is going on. Now, the second part of your question, occasionally MSL does store samples uh, in the carousel for future analysis. So we have um, a handful, maybe half a dozen uh, past drill samples we can go back to. That is, that is, that is a possibility. Thanks so much, Chris. Let's take a question from over here. Uh, this is a question for Chris House. This is Tristan Caro from CU Boulder. Um, I'm curious, I'm not familiar with the CO2 and SO2 photolysis that you uh, mentioned. And so I'm curious if that reaction network or pathway could be implicated in the formation of the sulfur containing organics that Sam has picked up in the past, or if that's a totally different uh, set of reactions that we're talking about. A good question, really good question. So. Um, the reason I, so, so there isn't much study on this kinds of reaction networks. Um, there are, you know, I, I've referenced some papers to try to show there could be a set of reactions that could, could form things like thioformaldehyde and, and, you know, uh, carbonyl sulfide and other various things. Um, certainly CO2 to formaldehyde is the well, is the well understood case. And that, that case uh, for CO2 goes to CO, CO goes to CO2, uh, sorry. CO2 goes to CO, CO goes to formaldehyde. The problem is that formaldehyde will back react with UV back to all the way back to CO2. So it doesn't accumulate in, Mar in the Martian surface very well. So we, you know, if you want to invoke that set of reactions, you need to have mechanisms by which that signal gets somehow incorporated into the rock and protected from UV. Uh, ice might do it, um, you know, fluids percolating down into the first few centimeters of the rock might do it. Uh, you know, we don't know. That's something that needs to be looked at. Your second question is, does it explain the other papers from MSL on organics? Again, no. Uh, you know, I mean, well, maybe, but, but th this was put forward as um, a way to get a trace amount of organic matter onto the surface that might give this weird ice tip signature. The bulk of organic carbon found by MSL and probably the, the, or the amazing organic carbon that was reported today uh, you know, from perseverance is, is, uh, is, is there's a lot more of it there, a lot more. And it's not, it's not give, probably not giving this crazy ice tip signature. Um, so I would interpret, you look at the MSL papers, those are, th those carbon sulfur compounds are, are released and being analyzed at, at high temperature, temperature cuts, 450 degrees C. The reason for that is we're trying to avoid the area where, the MTBS TFA organics come off and, and cause a big mess for us. 
Um, so that, you know, there are, there could be peaks at lower temperature, but we're looking at a much more re uh, recalcitrant refractory component of the Martian organic matter because that's where our system is cleanest. Right. And so it's probably more like a carriage, to be honest, not like, not like the crazy molecules I showed in my talk. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. And let's take a question from the audience on the left side. Yeah, this is Becky McCauley Wrench, NASA headquarters. I have one question for Chris and one for Danny, actually. Um, Chris, um, so with the samples that have already been collected for Perseverance, I wonder if there are any that you think are well suited um, for the analysis, or if there are any particular criteria you'd like to see in future samples um, to be able to do the analysis. Well, I think the the current samples collected are amazing and amazing for different reasons. You know, I think that I think that th you know this they remind me more of the of uh, 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 Andrew Steely and others um, investigation of the Allen Hills eighty four zero zero one rock, where it looks like clearly serpentinization happens on Mars and makes organic matter. It probably would make this patchy organic matter they're seeing, and I think that's totally phenomenal and amazing. Um, it, and I suspect that our, that organic matter does not have this crazy ice step signature. So this, this talk is really meant more like as you go up further, even, you know, next you want to see those, those sediments, you want to see the, 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 um, the, uh, sediments that, uh, the reason we went there, right. For the, for the Delta. And maybe after that, when you get up to, in, to where the, where those sediments are eroded off, maybe that's the place to look. And so, you know, I don't want to, I don't think that this is, should be driving the mission anytime soon. I think it's, 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 it's a point that we, we never expected to find things in that sandstone that had an erosionary surface on top of it, but that's, that's basically where the signal is strongest. Thanks, Chris. Um, and then Danny, my question for you was, um, I really liked, um, you know, kind of the, the three tiers, you know, and, and kind of bringing together different kinds of data uh, to identify biosignatures. I wondered if you wanted to, so I'm not an isotope <laughs> chemist, um, but you know, isotopes have always really fascinated me because there's just, there's so much information stuck in them and there's so much history in terms of where they've come from and how they've gotten the signature they've, they've gotten. And so I wondered, other than just, you know, depletion and enrichment, are there any other, is there any other data in isotope values that you think would be relevant to your, your analysis? Um, yeah, we tend to think in extremes, you know, Chris was talking about that <laughs> uh, because you, you, you maybe believe it a little more. Um, but certainly, you know, it's looking like on Mars, you know, one of the issues with carbon, to be frank, and the isotope value there is that on Mars, it, it's really similar to Earth, actually, the magmatic carbon, right? It's minus 25, minus, so, you know, we're, we're actually, the next step is to maybe look at uh, nitrogen, for example. That might be that we know is a little more enriched on Mars. So that might be another thing that we'd want to measure in an amino acid or any nitrogen containing compound. So we don't want to rely just on carbon. I think we need to be looking at uh, 15 to 14 nitrogen and D to H as well to try to put the story together. Um, the caveat with all this is it tends to take a lot of sample to do these compound specific isotope measurements. So, you know, if we've got samples that have been cooked by radiation and there's part per billion levels of amino acids, we may be just limited to looking at chirality and distributions. Uh, the isotope measurement may be hard, but I hope I'm wrong about that. <laughs> um, but because isotopes are important, they really are to help constrain the origin. Great. Thanks, Danny. Oh, well, can I, I, I just interject one, one point for Danny too? Um, and that, you, you know, that is question? another, another aspect would be if the, uh, we, if we knew that the organic matter was coming from the really, really enriched CO2 atmosphere, then you might, then you might be able to work it out being not earth by actually being, you know, minus or uh, plus 10 or something. And next we'll take a question from the audience. Hi, I'm Ann Lee from the University of Washington. And I just had a quick clarification question for Emily. I was wondering, so you saw the fluorescence between the carbonate and then also the silicate grains at guard. Did you also see that at DORB or was it just guard? Uh, we did see that. So in the particular area that Sherlock analyzed for, uh, for DORB, uh, where we had the pixel overlay, we had um, less carbonate, but we also saw silicate, or sorry, amorphous silicate as well as um, additional phosphate detections and I believe uh, some sulfate de detections as well. 
So it's slightly different, but uh, less, less carbonate in the region that we analyzed for Sherlock than in guard. And then no organics there otherwise, like you mentioned the double aromatics that you saw at guard, but you didn't see that at Dorb or? Uh, it wasn't localized to the, the carbonate in the same way, at least for where we saw. Okay, thank you. And there's a question online that I'm going to relay, and I'm probably going to pass it to Emily to answer then. So um, Peter's asked, can the Sherlock folks comment on the next steps for optimizing the use of Sherlock to detect organics for the rest of the mission? Did we learn things from the crater floor measurements that suggest ways to optimize organics detection later in the mission? Also, how about combining Sherlock measurements with other instrument measurements to optimize those organics detections? So uh, three questions in one for you. <laughs> okay, thank you, Peter. Uh, I might answer the, the bottom question first. So as we continue into the mission, um, it will continue to get colder, which is great for Sherlock uh, and, op and operating. So uh, that, that will be a plus. In terms of making measurements to optimize organic detection, uh, what Luther mentioned before, in terms of agreeing on specific places to take these observations, I think is one of the most challenging uh, parts because pr proximity science takes uh, additional resources and certainly having evidence from the other remote, uh, remote sensing instruments that are capable of being deployed with less resources, I think is critical in selection and in, the SETA formation, we saw that having analyses uh, performed by SuperCam as well as um, MassCamZ were critical in identifying uh, different details about each abrasion patch. But for example, with the guard abrasion patch that I talked about today, we were able to uh, see SuperCam uh, at least one point that was consistent with the carbonate, which made us feel better about our detection. In terms of moving forward and detecting organics, SuperCam also has a Raman. So if we have uh, a higher concentration of organics, it is possible that we'll be able to detect the organics with uh, Sherlock, the Raman, as well as fluorescence, and potentially with, uh, with SuperCam if the concentrations are high enough. And all the questions. Can I ask a, actually a little follow up on to that? So, and I'm, I know you're Sherlock and at SuperCam, but are there going to be um, actually like fluorescence issues with SuperCam Raman for the wavelength of their laser? Isn't there, is there an issue with detecting organic? Yeah. I don't and think, maybe okay. you don't know. <laughs> I think I'm going to defer to the SuperCam folks. All right. Uh, yeah. I think that's little far out of, uh, but that's a great question, Amy, in terms of getting additional observations. I think that getting the overlapping uh, overlapping measurements are critical in moving from an outcrop understanding down to the micron uh, understanding, especially since we have to be so targeted in the, in the samples that we select and then the further refining from there. And I think we did learn quite a bit in terms of uh, how to do scans in terms of, uh, it's nice to do the same types of scans between sites so you're able to compare the survey scans that are the, sa that are the same conditions as well as the uh, HDR scans, which are the higher pulses per point scans that are spaced farther apart. So I think all those, as well as the settings, there are a number of settings that we could customize with Sherlock. So I think we've, determined that where we can work where we can place pixel is really uh, a strong driver and where Sherlock wants to be placed so we do get those overlapping uh, measurements. Do you think that there the opportunity to do proxy on um, a natural target, um, especially by deploying Sherlock, is that does that have the potential to really help us um, triage the best samples for for um, abrasion and sampling? Are there are there concerns that the dust cover, for example, it's going to be challenging for Sherlock to 
uh, to see the organics through. I think, and especially based on the uh, talks that we saw later in the session, I would be very excited to have pixel and Sherlock measurements of the regolith uh, in Jezero, since we will be taking a regolith sample and we should be able to detect organics if they're present and we don't have to worry about abrading <laughs> per yeah. se because we're interested in the, the regolith. Excellent. And then there was one more question from Chris House online. What is the carbon range of percent carbon being seen? I don't know if we figured that out yet. <laughs> and is that question related to uh, the organic detection or the carbonates? Sorry, I meant the, or the organic uh, fluorescence. Uh, it's, I would say it's very small, so P, uh, lower than PPM. Yeah, lower than PPM around PPM levels. Okay, yeah. All right, so I mean, we have one minute left. Any other burning questions? All right, then I, I want to thank everyone for your attendance and participation and attention uh, during this session. So a reminder that there's a continuation um, online starting right now. So if you're interested, please feel free to log in and support the rest of our speakers. And thank you so much. Thank you.